And now here we have this very bewildered, puzzled MC. Let's read what he says again. In John chapter 2, and uh, here we have in verse 10. And he said to the bridegroom, Everybody serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. I simply don't understand it. Why is it that what you're doing is reversed? This is a very unusual way to do things. And it's because it's a very, very important motif. You see, in the world that the Master of Ceremonies came from, and perhaps in the world that you and I came from, we get the, the good first, and then pay the price later. But the truth of the Gospel is, Jesus has paid the price, and there is only the good. That's the beauty of grace. You see, the truth is that in, in the world, everything has to be sugar-coated, everything has to be made to look very attractive in order that you'll buy into it. But after buying into it or biting into it, you pretty soon see that the, the negative comes at the back end. But it isn't that way with God. The good news of the Gospel is, there is no bad news. So now, John says that this was the first of the signs that he did, and in doing so, he manifested his glory. Now, I think that's a very important statement for us just to bear in mind, because John has already told us that this is the Lamb of God, remember? Who take away the sin of the world. But prior to that, he said, that this word, this Lamb of God, this word of ours, became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Now that statement is important because the word there is tabernacled. He tabernacled amongst us. And the moment we hear this sense of tabernacle, we ought to be thinking to ourselves about the, the, the pilgrimage, the sojourn of the children of Israel who journeyed through the wilderness and in the desert. And in the desert, the Lord himself tabernacled with them. They had this temporary shelter that was called the tabernacle that was replaced by the temple, the permanent place. Now it's important because here we have Jesus described as the tabernacle. Uh, that will become much more evident to us as, as we move into the scripture. And certainly, if you were to read Hebrews, for example, you'll see that classically there. But Jesus is going to be depicted in this way. Now, the thing that's interesting is that the tabernacle was a temporary shelter designed for a pilgrim people. And that would be superseded by the temple. Now, it's to the temple that Jesus, who is the tabernacle, is about to go. And it's very, very important we see this, because what we're going to see here is that Jesus' first miracle is done in a home, is done in private, if you like. And that's actually quite interesting, because perhaps what's the picture for us there is not only is it a wedding but there's this sense of it's a gathering of an intimate family gathering and there in that place is where we see the miraculous the supernatural function i'm quite a believer in this you know thinking to myself that coming having come as i've done from the very big charismatic meetings where everything is about you know faith without fireworks is dead and actually thinking to myself that the supernatural should be much more natural and it's something that we ought to be seeing within the context of our, of our home groups of our, of, of, as, as we just move around together. But anyway, more of that another day. The point I want to grab hold of is this, is that Jesus' first public act begins in the temple. Now remember, when the tabernacle comes to the temple, uh, in Solomon's day, that was a moment where the Shekinah glory fell. But of course, here we're going to see something rather different. Now, the temple, by the time we come to the time of Jesus, has come to represent something of the absolute epicenter of man's alienation with God. Between man and God, we have this temple, and this temple has become a barrier to God. Now, dare I say it the case that in our modern day in which we live, for many of us, the church has become the epicenter of man's alienation for God. The church has become the principal obstacle, the principal barrier that stands between man and God. Going to church instead of being the church is one of the greatest problems that we as Christians have to deal with. 
Now this is a time, and it's the time of the Passover. And obviously you know that Passover is P-A-S-S-O-V-E-R. But what Jesus is interested in, he sees interested in coming to speak to the past over, the P-A-S-T over. Those of us who have been passed over by those who have hijacked the pass over. So let's look and see what happens. Verse 13, while the Passover of the Jews was at hand. It's very interesting, you know, that even in that little statement, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Well, it's almost as if to say, we've, we've, now, we've now kind of owned this, we've now commoditized this. And, and where Jesus is going to be clearly represented to us in John's Gospel as being a universal saviour, the Jews claim him was a very parochial saviour. And this, of course, is going to be a subject of tension as we go through the book, because the Jewish folk are going to say that salvation is by race. And Jesus is going to be saying, no, not at all. Salvation is by grace. And it's utterly indiscriminate come to that. So here we now have this idea that the Passover of the Jews was at hand. And the Jews went up to Jerusalem. And then the temple, uh, I beg your pardon, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, I'm sorry. And in the temple, he found those who were selling sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers. And he overturned the tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. You are making my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for his father's house will consume him. Well now, we have a, our scene is set. We've gone from this wonderful, uh, sedate, peaceful setting around the wedding to this very violent moment now in Jesus' first public appearance is in the temple and it's a shaking, it's a violent moment and we ought to be thinking to ourselves, what in the world is going on here? Now let's understand something, when it came to the Passover time, this was a time of amazing celebration, this was the most important feast of all. Everybody was thronged into Jerusalem, the place was wall to wall, you, you just couldn't move in there. Uh, the roads were prepared, everything was cleaned, everything was, was tidied. The sepulchres, the tombstones, they were whitewashed because lest anybody s touch them and, and, and thus defile themselves. And of course you'll remember that the concern of those people that were whitewashing the sepulchres was that it was to prevent an accidental kind of pollution. But Jesus comes and says, oh you're just like whitewashed sepulchres, that's exactly what you're like. Uh, it was a time of the animal feast. Uh, there was the time when there was the tithing of all the animals, the time of personal, personal purification. Uh, and people would come from all over uh, the ancient world to come up to the Passover feast. Rather like we see sometimes on the television in England, and it astonishes me when we see it, at the time of, of Hajj at the Mecca, where thousands of these pilgrims cram into this place. I mean, they come from all over the world. It's, it's, you just can't move. Uh, if you've travelled at all and, and been in any of these places in the Middle East and you see the way that these money changes work and so on, it's really quite fascinating. I remember when Haley and I went to Cairo and you'd go into the airport and it was like people were buzzing around trading and wanting you to swap your sterling or your dollars or whatever else and there was just this noise. It was, it was very different from Heathrow Terminal 5, I can tell you. But as you came up to the, uh, to the temple, the idea was that you couldn't come to the temple empty-handed. You had to bring with you your temple sacrifices. And to bring your temple sacrifices, you would have to encounter two things, the money changers and the animal inspectors. Well, there is a cacophony of noise that surrounds this, an absolute din. And it's into that din that Jesus walks and upturns the table and calls time on church as they knew it. Well, it's time for me, I'm afraid. But when we come back, we'll pick this up and really see where Jesus goes with it. So in the meantime, I wish you a blessed week, and I look forward to being with you next time. God bless.